Do you want to learn how to read electrical schematics? What if you could sit in a room with somebody who's designed hundreds of electrical schematics and be like, hey, what's this? What's that? How's this work? Well, that's exactly what we've been doing at Programming Electronics Academy. Every other week, we've been doing these live sessions with Dan Hinch, who's got decades of experience designing electronic products. And we are talking about schematics. This episode you're about to watch is just a quick kind of wrap up of some of the uh, interesting points that we had in our last session. They usually run about an hour. This is only 15 minutes, some of the highlights. We talked about an ESP32 programmer. It's a USB to UART programmer. And if you want to join us live, check out programmingelectronics.com. Enjoy. I met here with Dan Hinch. He has been developing electronic stuff since I've known him and a lot longer before that. He is a bounty of knowledge and he just loves to talk electronic stuff, which is a lot of fun for me and hopefully for you. What are we talking about today, man? Hello, everyone. We are going to be talking about an ESP32 programmer and it's nothing particularly special. And the origin of it is from doing some manufacturing with ESP32, where I don't know why it took me so long to realize that I could reduce the cost of manufacturing by taking the programmer off of the board because, I mean, once you've programmed the thing and you've screwed it onto the wall, you don't need it anymore. No one that, that buys the product that I was making was gonna ever program it or ever need to interact with the UART. So why bother including all that one time use circuitry. And as a result, now that I've designed this, whenever I make a product or a prototype that has an ESP32 on it, I don't need to include all the programming circuitry on it, which saves me a buck or two per board. And when you're doing 5,000, 10,000 of something, you're talking about real money there. So this programmer is basically the, the USB to UART bridge with a voltage regulator for additional power and then a USB connection, and then a really funky series of outputs. And you can see in the, in the picture that Mike has put up right there that there's a bunch of pins sticking straight up. There's a bunch of exposed pins or exposed through hole connectors, and then some pinout descriptions at the top and the bottom. And the purpose of this is to provide me different ways of hooking up with things. So the unsoldered through holes that are going down the right-hand side of the board allow me to solder on a header there, which is just the standard sort of pin header that you would see on an Arduino or a breakout board that allows you to connect the little jumper wires to it. And that lets me plug that into or solder to any number of different boards that have ESP32s on them that I've got scattered around. So if I have one where I blew up the programming circuit on it, I can splice this thing in and control it that way. But the thing on the top is by far the coolest thing. That looks like an old sort of like an IDE header for those of you that used to work with like old, old hard drives back in the day. That actually connects to something called a tag connect plug of nails. Plug of nails. All right. So a, a bed of nails, there's called a bed of nails programmer or bed of nails testing. And okay. that's a jig that they have in factories that has these things called pogo pins, which it's a pin that points straight up. And this section down here is a spring so that when you press on it, it'll depress a little bit. And if you put a board on there with sufficient pressure and you've got all these different pins underneath it, you can make temporary connections very securely. So you'll put the board on it, press it down. You've usually got this little lever that pushes the board down into the bed of nails. So this isn't a bed of nails, it's a plug of nails. This is the plug of nails connector. So this is the thing that plugs into the programmer. And then this is the plug of nails. So these pins actually retract into the connector. And then these steel pins on the outside help you indicate that they basically help you line it up with the board. And then on your PCB, you have the footprint that is six pads just exposed on the board with three holes that surround it. And then you just line those pins up and you push it down. And then they have some connectors that have little sort of sprongy bits on the outside mm -hmm. that can latch onto the board. Or if you're only like, I just got to program it, go on to the next one, program it, go on to the next one. You just press this down, hit program. 30 seconds later, you disconnect, take that board, put it in the box, go on to the next one. 
they have this guy here, which is a castellated edge connector. So you don't even have to put pads on your board. You oh, actually man. just put these little like scalloped edges on the edge of your board. And then you just slide the board over that pin right there. And the, and the board edge has the conductive pads on it that interface with those little springs. And now like you don't even have to have the, the full footprint on your board taking up space. You just have those pads at the edge of your board and you can program it that way. Yeah, that that looks like almost a built-in jig then because then you just slide it on, right? Is Am I right that the PCB yep. sandwiches between that little rod there, right? Yeah, the, is, exactly. Okay. Wow, okay, that's really neat. But that is $84 for that, so. Hey, if you're going to figure you got to program 100, 200 boards, like, I, man, that would pay for itself I, no time. I honestly was sitting here going, why have I not bought this already? <laughs> so yeah, so this is the, the whole point was to use the, the plug of nails to start programming the boards. And once I had the thing designed, I'm like, well, why would I put the programming circuitry on any ESP32 design that I ever make anymore when I can just just use my programmer and that saves me prototyping costs then as well. For those of you that are wondering how, how schematics get done, how schematics are developed in the real world, a lot of the time, you just use the application schematic that you get from the manufacturer. The manufacturer already knows how their chip works or how their circuit works or how their subsystem works. Why would you recreate what the manufacturer has already done? So you just copy wholesale schematics straight from the manufacturer into your design. And a lot of the time, all you're really doing is hookup. And that's just the way it goes. There, there are very few problems that I run into that are brand new. A lot of them have already been solved by manufacturers already. And you're just kind of hooking up breakout boards to breakout boards to a microcontroller just at a more granular level. So this is the schematic from Espressive, and this is their programmer down here, which is, you know, for want of clarity, basically the exact same thing that I have in my schematic. I don't like the way they drew it. I don't like their schematics, really. This down here, I find appalling. Uh, this, is, this is very hard for me to understand. So, you know, I don't copy it just, you know, tooth and nail. I do redesign it or re-diagram it myself so that it's legible for myself. But the functionality of it is basically as designed by Espressif because they're pumping it out on millions of dev boards every day of the week. So why would I try to redesign something that has worked a million times before? So Dan, where do you, where would you get this? So like, I, I think of a data sheet. Sometimes if I look at a data sheet for a part, I will see a, you know, like recommended diagram, you know, mm -hmm. is that where you got this one just from a data sheet or is it elsewhere? Or is uh, that usually where you'll find those kind of things or? So this is straight off of the Espressive website based around their dev kit. So they have all of these related documents that, that are available for you for their dev kits. It is in the manufacturer's best interest to make sure that you know how to use and how to copy their designs so that you are more encouraged to go to manufacturing with their product. It costs them very little to publish this schematic in exchange for, I have used tens of thousands of their chips now because they wound up being very, very easy to use and very easy to integrate. There are so many different ways to program different microcontrollers. That is some of the secret sauce that different manufacturers use. There are standards, there's something called JTAG, that is the, the most universal way to program microcontrollers. It's a six, six, eight, 12. I don't remember exactly how many pins it is, but that gives you full access to most microcontrollers, not all, but most microcontrollers. That is a way with JTAG that you can actually run microcontroller in debug, meaning that you can actually pause operation of your microcontroller mid program and you can examine what's actually written into the memory, what's actually in the flash. You can actually see the bytes, the individual bits. Uh, you, can, you can read through the actual values that are stored in the registers of your microcontroller real time. And then you can pause operation and you can step through programs. It's very, very cool. And if you're more used to writing software in a non-firmware environment and you're like, well, why can't I use real debug tools? It's because you're using a programmer like this, meaning the, the UART programmer. 
What this programmer does is it takes an input from, uh, basically you send your program down, the actual code over USB, and then in the circuit, you have a USB to UART converter. So this takes the UART signal and it strips all of the USB off of it and converts it into just standard old school, 60 year old serial signaling. And that actually gets transmitted then to your microcontroller. But all it does is it downloads code. Depending on what ESP32 product or boot or dev kit that you're using, sometimes you have to do a, like a funky button press sequence to get it into a state where you can download code to it. And that's what this little circuit does here. Or this little, this little bit of the subsystem. These are two NPN transistors. These are, I mean, they're, they're N3904s. These are the sorts of things that in the eighties, when you bought a let's learn about electronics kit, you would have a couple of these in there. Nice. Like these are, these are the oldest of old school <laughs> transistors. The, these are some of the oldest active components that were ever developed before a five, five, five timer existed. <laughs> The N3904 did. The, the only thing that predates these are probably vacuum tubes. So obviously that, to me, that implies if it's still being used, they they do the job. It's like nails have been around for a long time. Oh yeah. We use nails. You know what I mean? Bikes have been around. You know, is that is that ba the basic idea? So it's not like they're going on a style or... In this circuit, these are acting like switches. That's all they're doing. The, the primary difference between this and a MOSFET is that and with a MOSFET, you wouldn't actually conduct current from, for basically from, from your input to the output. With a transistor, you do. There, it's a current-driven rather than a voltage-driven active component. So in this case, you send current into the base, and the current is basically pushing this door open. So you, you, like you open the door to let people through. And the more people are coming through here, the more people can come through here, which is probably a horrible analogy that I just came up. So you have to push this door open farther in order to let more people through here. But the more you open this door, the more things are able to come through here. So this is current driven rather than voltage driven. Now, why did they use a current driven component rather than a voltage driven component? Who knows? Uh, I would suspect probably cost. Right. And for all intents and purposes, it's invisible to the end user. I mean, I'm just selecting, you know, I've got a GUI and I'm just selecting whatever, you know, oh, yeah. upload defaults. And sometimes I'll mess around with that stuff. But I think the, the only part, way you would see this is if you hooked it up to an oscilloscope. I don't think this is exposed in the output of the, in the little programming window at the bottom of your IDE. I don't think it says anything like toggling DTR, toggling RTS, I don't or even enable so. Yeah, I think there was a question about this component here and what its purpose is. And it, it looks like a bunch of diodes down here and they seem to be pointed in a very weird direction. They would normally be pointed down towards where you expect the current to flow rather than sort of against the flow of current. And this is a special diode that is meant to dissipate a static electric shock. Used to be the case that you had electronics and if you were in the winter and it was super dry and you were wearing socks and you walked across the carpet and you touched a piece of electronics, there was a solid chance that you could just blow the thing up with a static shock. And that doesn't really happen anymore. And one of the reasons for that is because these diodes are integrated into almost every piece of electronics that we have now, either as a discrete component like this, or it's integrated into the chip itself. And a lot of data sheets will show you that they have integrated ESD, which is electrostatic discharge protection. And that's what this is. This is an electrostatic discharge protection diode. So these prevent the flow of current unless the spike of voltage on there is incredibly high. And then if it's an incredibly high spike of current or spike of voltage, then these are very, very, very quick to allow current to flow in the opposite direction. Meaning if there is a spike of electrostatic discharge on here, it will go through here and be dissipated to ground rather than going into the rest of your circuit. And you have one of these on each of the signal lines that's connected to your device. And it's very common to see this on anything that has a plug on your board where somebody could be sitting there with a cable and a high static level on their person, and then they plug it in. 
and then they zap the device. All right, I understand why C101 and C102 are needed, but why two sets of those? All right, so sure. ceramic 100 nanofarad for high frequency. So we're talking about capacitors here. I'm, I'm assuming the C stands for capacitor, right? So this is the section that he's talking about right yep. here. And you have the 100 nanofarad also could be called a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, same value, different different way of describing it. Right. However you're feeling that day is you talk about nanofarads or microfarads. Right, this guy must have been like, flipping back and forth. He wasn't sure, you know, he was just like, I don't know, microfarads, nanofarads, let's just split it. I mean, it very well may be that I just copy and pasted this out of a different schematic. So the 100 nanofarad are standard sized capacitors for dissipating noise that is at the frequency that modern uh, transistors function at. So the noise that modern transistors create, and that's what is inside every one of those microchips is just a bunch of transistors and some other stuff. But basically it's the transistors that are causing the potential noise on the board. And these capacitors help to dissipate that because they won't conduct energy when it's just direct current because there's just a total gap here. But at that frequency, this becomes a dead short to ground. And so it will take that noise and dump it to ground and give you very clean power on your power rails here. The 4.7 microfarad cap is there a couple of reasons. One, because the data sheet told me to. Like if the data sheet tells me to put a capacitor on the power rail, I don't question it. And then I don't spend 10 hours going through my old textbooks to try to figure out why it is a 4.7 microfarad capacitor. I'm like four hours deep into trying to understand the difference between quickcrete and sackcrete and how much aggregate and what the size of the granules are in the aggregate. And I'm like, dude, what you need to do is pour concrete. You don't need to become a concrete engineer. But the instinct is still there to, to want to try to understand because honestly, I don't know, maybe it will become important. No, it turns out you go to Home Depot, you buy the concrete, you pour the concrete and you go on to the next headache. Yeah, very true, very true. All right, everybody. Hey, have a great week and look forward to seeing everybody next time. Take it easy. Thanks, guys. Bye.